Thanks and good morning. I'm Travis Matheny. I'm going to talk a, a little bit about natural history of some common hip problems. Now, you've already heard a lot of different hip problems, and so it's obviously impossible to cover everything in 25, 30 minutes. Um, so my main purpose is going to be to review a lot the sort of the common etiologies of things that go on to hip arthritis, which is sort of what we on the orthopedic side deal with. So the question really gets to, in a lot of ways, how do we get from the image you see on the left to the one on the right, and does really everybody go there, or does some people sort of hover there that we never meet? There's lots of etiologies for hip osteoarthritis. You see this whole laundry list here. There's obviously more that I couldn't include, including trauma, infection, bony or cartilaginous dysplasias. Hip dysplasia, leg cavity, protein disease, slip capital femoral epiphysis, or skippy, and this quote unquote idiopathic variety that we'll touch upon a little bit later. Dr. Millis already mentioned this in one of his slides. This is um, uh, Jim Ernst's work, and this is published back in 86, did an ICL, uh, an instructional course lecture on this. And I like this slide a lot because it helps me to kind of solidify a little bit in my mind how uh, I think about uh, common etiologies of hip uh, articular problems. Again, just reviewing, once again, you have hip dysplasia up here, our number one variety. I guess the cursor's not working there. Uh, then he also talked about late calvary perthes disease and skippies and idiopathic. Then you have this whole other group down here accounting for about 10, 12 percent. And then again, in the last 15 years, of uh, Professor Gons and others that really helped us to better understand how hip OA and its uh, originates and what its causes are, and therefore generate this newer general type of hip condition. Uh, popularized uh, as femoral tabular impingement. So with that, you can kind of reorganize our thinking a little bit and get a more modern look. We sort of come up with two main categories, DDH and FAI. And I'm going to talk, focus, I guess my battery down here. I'm going to focus primarily on these two right here. Uh, again, for sake of time, leaving those other guys off, but I think they're going to it'll become clear what we're getting to and how those guys can uh, generate hip OA later on as well. For the etiology of pain, when a patient really uh, presents to your office with the quote, with the quote unquote, my hip hurts, can vary widely. We've talked about uh, extra articular, uh, periarticular problems as well as articular problems. Ultimately, the problem leading to hip OA is uh, as a mechanic one, as Dr. Mills also alluded to. You got acetabular rim overload with hip dysplasia. Uh, you also have acetabular cartilage impaction and or rim impaction with thermoacetabular impingement. I hope this. This becomes a recurring theme as the day goes on. This is going to be something you almost dream or nightmare about tonight. <laughs> so the real goal of my talk today is to talk uh, is to review what we know about the natural history of some of these two main types of hip conditions leading to adult osteoarthritis and pain, namely DDH and FAI. Just to back it up a few steps, the main state of treatment continues to be early detection in a lot of ways when we're just starting with hip dysplasia. However, obviously, certain cases still continue to be missed. And if hip dysplasia is the most common cause of hip OA, it occurs in a variable amount of severity. So not everybody has the same disease, and not every hip that looks the same on x-ray belongs to the same uh, customer. That gets to the point that not all cases develop pain. And therefore, we, we don't uh, know the true incidence of adult patients mainly. And this is going to become a, a common theme here that the common statement when we talk about natural history is we don't really know the denominator. We don't know how many people are walking the streets of Boston and the rest of the world with a weird looking hip uh, x-ray but never seem to get into trouble with it. <coughs> Estimates of adult hip dysplasia there have been calculated in some studies. This one is a fairly large one. This is a, a common epidemiological theme where you take a study that has nothing to do with what you're interested in but happens to have a patient population that can uh, capture some of what you're interested in. In this study, the Copenhagen Heart Study, much like the Framing Heart Study here locally, had a group of researchers who decided to apply for a grant and they said, we want to actually look at your hip x-rays because you happen to be getting for something else. Now, not a full set of uh, DDH specific hip x-rays that Dr. Bixby talked about, but a really nice set of, uh, basically the basic data you needed. And they had a very large group of people that did or didn't have uh, hip pain and what they found was that if, uh, when they measured it based on their criteria, that they estimated around 10% of the people in that population had hip dysplasia that, and didn't know anything about uh, of the total population. Well, only about half of those people actually had hip osteoarthritis for whatever reason. So what determines the outcome and what is the natural history? This, this is a real question. Other questions that come up from patients is when will my hip start to hurt? If I've got dysplasia, I walked in your office, I had this abdominal x-ray, and then my 
my PCP said, you got to go see an orthopedic surgeon because you're the read from Dr. Bixby says you got hip dysplasia. Other questions, should I lose weight to save my hips? Is that going to be a big, is that going to help me? We always talk about BMI and obesity and weight loss to help our knees, but is the same thing hold true for the hips? And then another common question comes up, what about activity level? If I keep pounding away and running marathons, is that going to kill my hip or can I keep doing what I want to do? So to answer that question, several studies exist trying to determine the natural history of hip dysplasia, and most are really retrospective evaluations of data sets obtained for the purpose other than DDH we talked about, and aren't really true prospective natural history studies, unfortunately. If you have hip dysplasia, though, the factors that have been associated with development of arthritis in some of these studies include those you see here, the severity of dysplasia, I think that makes intuitive sense. Worse looking dysplasia means more uh, rim overload, worse stability, uh, sorry, instability. Uh, increased activity level, loading the joint uh, more frequently or uh, increased loads, and also along the idea of increased load, increasing body mass index amount that you have to carry around. So what have people done to try to evaluate this? Then some of these larger group studies, you have uh, Wong et al. Uh, looked at the Melbourne Collaborative Cohort Study. This was a longitudinal cancer study, actually, with x-ray and basic demographic information. So from that, uh, they looked at more than 38,000 patients and found those with an increased BMI, more than 30, had an increased risk of to going on to total hip replacement. I think this is a, a one point I'll bring up here in a little bit, but gets to what do we use as our endpoint for mode of failure, meaning when was it, when do we call your hip dysplasia significant? Is it significant only if you get a hip replacement or is it significant if it's enough to cause you pain? Other factors associated with development of arthritis and DDH include these other two large cohort studies, one by Jacobson et al. in Denmark, and another one by Jinguchi in Japan. And they looked at, and they found that increasing severity of dysplasia, they more or less confirmed what we thought, led to increased prevalence in earlier presentation of hip OA and also going on to total hip replacement. So what about the question of activity level? Does that make a difference? Uh, Schmidt looked at this, uh, evaluated former elite marathon runners, myself not included in the study. <laughs> but you see a local bred person here on this, on this image to the right, uh, found that they had slightly increased prevalence of hip OA in this study. However, this data is not entirely clear, and I, I think this gets down to some of the individuality of the disease process, where Spectre looked at uh, over 1,000 women in the Chingford study group in England. He found the opposite, where basically he thought that runners had similar at risk of hip OA to non-athletes. And this, again, this study was looking at OA specifically on, on x-ray, not necessarily who went on to total hip replacement. We tried to look at this here recently. There's a group of uh, uh, docs and centers around the country where that uh, Dr. Mills kind of uh, got started. Uh, includes over 1,000 periacetabular osteotomy patients. And out of that data set, the question was, can we help, out of these folks, is it, is it possible to determine whether or not maybe if we look at it in a different way, that BMI, your severity displays, or your activity level might drive the age at which you come to surgery as a surrogate to say, it hurt your hip more, therefore you showed up earlier. And what we found was that, in fact, the patients that had really high activity levels, we used the UCLA activity score where 8 to 10 was a high active, highly active person exercising several times a week, long distance running, et cetera. And those with uh, severe dysplasia, meaning the center edge angles that Dr. Bixby were talking about, less than 5 degrees, uh, they had a significant change. Uh, they came in a lot earlier, on average about 6 years earlier. Those you see here in the middle, I've highlighted these mild, moderate dysplasia and minimal, moderate activity folks uh, from the severe dysplasia folks and the highly active folks here because it's the most um, obvious difference. But I think it also bears mentioning that if you have one or the other of these, you're either severely dysplastic or you had were highly active, you still had an effect. So both of those, what you glean from that is that both of those things are independent predictors of presenting earlier with pain. And incidentally, we also asked them how long they've been having pain. The average person had pain for one to three years before they had surgery. So it's true that those folks presented earlier and they had their symptoms on average about the same amount of time beforehand. So I guess it gets back to the point that severity of dysplasia and BMI may have a real effect, uh, sorry, and uh, activity level may have a real effect. So in summary, what do we know about DDH? Well, hip dysplasia remains the most common cause of end-stage hip arthritis. We've talked about that. And the factors appear most important in developing pain in the presence of adult DDH still include severe dysplasia and activity level. BMI still leads a little bit to be accounted for, but I think there's some good data to support that. And intuitively, again, I think it makes some sense. <laughs>
What we don't know still, though, even from the data I just presented, is whether or not you make a change in your BMI, will that have a significant will that have a significant effect on the longevity of your hip or change where, uh, the age at which you present with painful arthritis? As we do not know the number of hips with displays that don't develop pain, we still typically wait for the symptoms. So that's the bottom line. We don't operate on an x-ray. The keys then are, to, if you have for us, infants that have hip dysplasia, we try to fall them to skeletal maturity or some there, uh, somewhere thereabout. So we know what their hips are going to look like as they head off because we know there's still a small percentage of these patients that are treated to success with their hip braces and pelvic harnesses and or surgery before the age of 10 that then to go on to develop silent dysplasia that doesn't really poke up its head until the mid-20s, early 30s. Got to make those folks informed consumers, in my book. Those folk, if you have a patient that hip, had hip dysplasia that was treated, I try to counsel all patients and families, this is not something that's automatically over until you're done growing. So we'll move on to femoral acetabular impingement, our next big sort of box of problems. Just to review again, we have these two groups here, and from our type of impingement, in a lot of ways, the, the majority of it seems to be encompassed by Prothes disease, slip capital femoral pistis, or skiffy, or this idiopathic bump on the femoral neck. I'd, I'd pause for a second just to remind ourselves that I've, I'm kind of glossing over, sort of intentionally, this other group down here, skeletal dysplasias, infection, deposition disorders, and trauma. Not because they don't matter, but I think the bigger picture here is that FAI is a mechanical problem. So it's, it happens on the spectrum. It includes cam and pincer type impingement, morphologies that we talked about. So we really talk about femoral acetabular impingement or FAI morphology. What's the shape that gets you to the problem? Because the whole point of this stupid little cartoon is that you have mismatch in shape and that grinds the gears or tears your cartilage up. So if we just get down to these three basic ones, the uh, three I just mentioned, how common is Perthes, for instance? Is this, how big is this problem of FAI that we're talking about? We know it has an incidence that's estimated around 1 in 1,200 kids, so not too uncommon, and it's much more common in uh, boys. What about Skiffy? Well, different estimates are out there. National database is looking at about 10.8 per 100,000 uh, kids, and it's slightly more even male to female ratio. And then there's this idiopathic cam deformity. This is also what people have been referring to as perhaps what we think is uh, mechanically driven changes in the way the growth happens at the top of the femur. You know, the proximal femoral growth plate or physis can alter its, uh, the way it appears on x-ray at least, uh, forming what small, moderate, or severe cam type lesions with different types of sports. And that's been shown in different uh, areas of the literature from uh, hockey players, baseball players, etc. I'm going to touch briefly on uh, pincer impingement because I think the majority of what we're going to really get into is what cam uh, lesions are like, and I think really that's what we're talking about with skiffy and idiopathic and perthes. But just to say that uh, I think the data on whether or not pincer impingement begets arthrosis is mixed. Uh, we, uh, some studies, when they're looking at how commonly, how common is it that you have cam and pincer lesions together, estimates go as high as 50%. So it used to be that, I guess the initial thinking was you had cam or you had pincer. Actually, pretty commonly you can have both. Uh, which one is the real arthritis generator? Well, I think it gets down to under, an understanding of where the arthritis would happen in most cases if you had a pincer lesion. This cartoon here shows the hip that's flexing up, and as soon as the femur impinges on the anterior acetabulum, you get the little crunch of the labrum here. But you, the most common arthritic lesion is actually in the back and the bottom of the acetabulum, not the real primary weight-bearing area where the, you can literally lever that femur out. There's, a, I don't know if you recall, the arthrogram that Dr. Bixby just showed in that patient who had the AIS avulsion, AIS overgrowth, femoral shaft impinges on that, and literally you lever the femur, femoral head out. In arthroplasty, people understand this phenomenon very well. It's one reason why you have to pick carefully where you position the socket because they're inherently an unstable joint. They're not like your hip that has inherent stability built into it. So we know that we have to position the hip right, the hip, the hip socket part of the prosthesis correctly to avoid the big complication of hip replacements, which is dislocation. But the same thing can happen in your own hip. I guess to come back to the main point, though, secondary arthrosis may be milder or pure pincer. And again, uh, there's, there's definitely stuff in the literature now that talks about whether or not this is a real problem or not. I think this can be a problem for arthrosis, but it leads to be determined, well, it's left to be determined whether or not it's, gonna, it's the biggest player as far as arthrosis in adults. <laughs>
So what really happens to these hips? Well, how do you determine this? We need longitudinal data. And I, we also adjust that people apparently or fortunately don't leave Iowa or Texas that they come from there. And the benefit of that is that there's folks in Texas and Iowa and Iowa City in particular that have these amazing databases where they treat these kids and they have the ability to call them up on the phone, get them out of the field and bring them back in, get an x-ray. All right, so they have really long-term follow-up. Right? Perfect natural history study. <laughs> right? Now, <clears throat> we look at Perthes. What do we know about that? Well, there's been a lot written about it. It's like DDH, it's like uh, a lot of these hip problems that have been seen, really better recognized since the early uh, 1900s, late 1800s, whenever we started getting radiographs available on a routine basis, people started describing Perthes. And in Lake Calvary Perthes, in fact, for, uh, they all got their name on it because they all wrote about it the same year and published it. So common radiographic finding, we still don't understand exactly what causes it. But what we do know is secondary effects of it. So we know that people that have mild, moderate, severe Perthes disease and mild, moderate, severe deformity afterwards will really have different courses. And at least that was our thought. Their motion doesn't look so great in clinical exam, but what happens to them long term? Should we be operating all these people because the motion is not good, even though they're, they're not painful? Well, the folks in Iowa said, in, uh, in Texas, in fact, said, I don't think so, because uh, when they did their initial review, they looked at the end point of hip replacement. They said, how many folks are getting hip replacements? They said, well, the average person is going to get their hip replacement or ask for it sometime in the fifth or seventh to seventh decades. I mean, 40s or 60s. And if you are a teenager, that you might as well be on death's doorstep. <laughs> so how can you do a hip replacement when I'm 40? <laughs> but that said, uh, it's hip replacement. It's not pain, it's hip replacement. Again, the primary factor determining the age of onset of symptoms appears to be uh, the amount of residual deformity. I didn't get into the specifics of how you grade and how we, talk, how we classify perthes, but needless to say, increasing severity means increasing mismatch in shape between the femoral head and the acetabulum, okay? Or a match in shape that's not round on round, where you have what we call somewhere in the middle aspherical congruence. You have an egg inside of a semi-matched socket, which flexes and extends, but to try to explain to patients and families, try to imagine dropping that egg inside another little semi-matched thing and rotating that guy. Okay? It doesn't work very well. So your flexion extension is your wheelhouse. It's abduction a little bit. Rotation, not your wheelhouse. And do you, you need a lot more rotation than you think in your day-to-day -day life. So it's a pain generator, arthritis generator. On Skiffy, what do we know? Well, long-term data from Iowa again point to the great pain to great pain and function scores. It's not great meaning gr good pain and function scores with inside two screw fixation, which is the gold standard for fixing it, with an average follow-up of 41 years. What an awesome study. Common theme theme though is Metaphyseal prominence, how, does it, how did they get by with this? Well, the metaphyseal bump here, just to warn people, my thing is down here. Can I get this to work? Yeah, here we go. Where the arrow is, the physis is here, growth plate's there. The femoral head is, people would describe the ice cream scoop falling off the cone here, but it's back here when it should be more up on top here. You have this metaphyseal prominence. Now I've got a cam lesion. As soon as this hip flexes up, it's gonna start banging into this acetabular rim. That's what we're all worried about now that we understand what FAI is. However, you do see this as a common theme over time, especially in kids that are like early teens, have growth remaining. This area will flatten out in a lot of kids, right? So now all of a sudden my cam lesion starts to disappear. Now what do I do? Do I have to do anything about it? And so the one theory was, well, of course they're not getting them, they're not all going to, to uh, crap, it's because they are remodeling their bone. They don't, they're getting rid of their cam lesion. That's awesome. They're kind of taking care of the problem by themselves. However, uh, with more critical review of these patients, it appears that they may not be doing quite as well as we thought. And that's what's coming out of the literature here in the last uh, four or five years. With regard to Perthes, uh, folks back at Texas, uh, Texas Scottish Rite Hospital in Dallas went back and they looked at it more carefully and said, you know what? Hip replacement is kind of a hard endpoint, and yeah, that, that is, it makes intuitive sense, like, that's when I know that the pain was so bad, I had to do anything to get rid of it, I'm going to go to hip replacement, and it takes a lot of other things into account, lifestyle needs, I can't afford to have a hip preservation surgery right now, I've got three kids at home, I don't have, I can't take time off my job, all those things can come into play in your decision making, so, Hip replacement does make sense as an endpoint. However, it's 
not the only one, and in some cases may not be the best. Again, I think a lot of us would argue, what if there was a way to keep you from getting to hip replacement pain? Wouldn't that be good if we stopped, if we knew that your, when your pain started so we could possibly address it before the cartilage was all gone? So they looked at it and said, well, as it turns out, even though people are hitting their hip replacements in their fifth to seventh decade of life, that are actually getting to pain a lot sooner. 20% in these kind of mild, 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 sort of milder versions of deformity and perthes, uh, at up to 60% with the, just that middle ground one assigned, uh, described, the aspherical congruency egg in a similarly matched socket. When were they starting their pain? Second to third decade, as early as that, right? Teenage to 20s. So that's when the symptoms started to show up for these people. So I guess the common theme here is we don't really know the true natural history, but we know that things aren't good the whole way through up until the very end. With regard to Skiffy, more recent data has demonstrated that worse symptoms when they're using more age-appropriate outcome measures. So what does that mean? Well, uh, I don't know much of the, of the uh, outcomes literature you look at or the studies you're looking at. You'll, come and, you'll commonly see outcome scores or utility instruments, however you want to call them, Described like the Harris hip score is a classic one, Iowa hip score. Then there's newer ones, the non-arthritic hip score, the Who's, the Womack, all these different uh, outcome measures. And like uh, one thing to know about outcome measures is that they are designed with specific questions, and each question is supposed to be tested such that it's written a certain way. The the questionnaire is actually executed in a certain way, meaning that I don't read the questions to you, you read them yourself, etc. <coughs> and to get a certain response that means the questionnaire is responsive, valid, and et cetera, that it works. It's measuring what you think it's supposed to measure. Turns out the current measures aren't that awesome for pediatric populations. So kids that are younger than 18, all these HIP scores that were initially designed, Dr. Harris over at MGH did the Harris HIP score, uh, I want to say he initially published it back in the 70s, is that right? Anyway, it's, his patients were hip replacement patients. So they're end stage arthritis. And he asked a series of questions that he thought made sense for, I want to know how your hip is doing. Does it bother you? Do you have to hold on the handrail to get on off public transportation? Do you have to use a cane? Do you have to, can you walk around the block? Uh, do you have trouble putting your shoes and socks on? Ask those questions to the average 22 year old who's got some mild arthritis and or mild hip pain. That kind of check, 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 and this is called a ceiling effect, saying it will look like my hip on that questionnaire is doing great. However, if you really ask me how much is your hip hurting, can you do, has it decreased your activity level? Have you changed what you had to do with your day-to-day -day life? Can you sit in a chair at work all day long? You work on your feet all day, can you do that still? All of a sudden, your numbers start to change and you start looking like a worse hip, uh, hip patient. Other things we know is that Early radiographic changes seem to be showing up in the majority, even in mild slips. That's also been reported. So it means that you get these x-rays, you see the remodeling that we showed. However, if you look carefully with either plain radiographs, you start seeing the subchondral sclerosis, meaning the bone at the rim of the socket is actually taking a little bit of beating. That means also that the cartilage underneath it is also going or gone. If you get an MRI afterward, you, clear, you can actually see really impressive amounts of cartilage damage at the rim. Now again, that's, that's the imaging component of it. I don't want to say just imaging, <laughs> it's important, but the, the key is we don't just operate on the image and we don't know the natural history completely. So it still gets back to, we, have to, we include all that in the whole summary of what we do for the patient, how we discuss the, question, the problem with the patient. And then finally, we also know that when we had a chance to look inside some of these joints with mild slips, uh, we took the opportunity to just pin them inside you and they've been having some symptoms for maybe up to a just a few months. Took a sneak peek inside, and what do you see? Well, you actually see, where did my image go? Oh, God, there it is. You actually see a decent amount of cartilage damage, right? All this red and kind of crab meat looking stuff, that's the cartilage that's supposed to be nice and smooth. You can kind of get an idea of what it's supposed to look like way in the back here, but this is all beaten up cartilage. That guy's, that kid's just had this, uh, had a slip for just a couple months. It was stable, they're walking around, had some mild discomfort, ended up getting their self pinned inside you to stop the progression, but they'd already gone on to some pretty significant looking damage inside the, trip, uh, the hip joint. This is that remodeling effect, all right? The remodeling doesn't happen spontaneously. The, the bump disappears because it's banging into something, and the something it's banging into is joint cartilage. The primary factor associated with later pain continues to increase as the amount of deformity increases. So we know that, again, increased deformity seems to beget uh, worse damage. So what does this all mean to me? Well, I know that no study is really perfect. Uh, 
So how do we measure outcomes? We talked briefly about that. We ought to, I think one of our main uh, pushes now is to look more critically at the type of uh, outcomes questionnaires we're using. Uh, there are other outcomes uh, instruments that are being designed that are more young person specific and so we're starting to use those more. Is the fact that you didn't decide to undergo hip replacement an adequate measure to say your hip is doing fine? I think I would say no. I guess the real question is do all hips in the end when we're considering both hip dysplasia and FAI go on to end stage OA? We don't know the answer to that. So the real answer I think is probably no. So in summary, the natural history of hip dysplasia in F5 points to the fact that mechanical damage in early arthrosis are not an uncommon phenomenon. Therefore, I guess at this stage, I can really advocate for uh, endeavoring to recognize early morphologic trouble cases when they come up. You got to make informed consumers of our patients so they understand what their hip problem is, especially an asymptomatic person. Follow them over time. Don't let them disappear into the woodwork. And then treat those that have become symptomatic as we deem appropriate here today. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your time. <laughs>